Sumner County meaningful and attractive to a broad audience by collecting, studying, <coughs> exhibiting, and interpreting through educational programming, special events, and publications and research. <coughs> so, a little bit of the history about the museum. It was founded in 1975 and was actually broke ground on June 6th in 1980 and opened the following year in 1981. The museum was founded by, by a number of people, but two of those um, being Robert Ramsey and Mr. John Garrett. Now, a lot of people say a photo says a thousand words, and, and this one is particularly interesting to me. From the first glance, 
you might see a young man with his automobile posing for a picture. But if you look a little closer, and anybody that knows anything about John Garrett knows one thing. You can see at his feet around the area, there's snow on the ground. Now, notice what John's got on. <laughs> Short sleeve shirt. And I can honestly say that he's probably one of the toughest guys I ever met. And I only had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of years ago. And after I took the position at the museum, John, of course, invited me over to his house, wanted to talk about um, family lineage and genealogy and, and quickly connected us. It took him a matter of minutes. And, but to backtrack, when I got to his house, just a, you know, a couple of years before he passed, when I, when I arrived, he was in his workshop building furniture, something we all know that he loved to do. And, or another time he was out still cutting his grass. I know another thing that he thoroughly enjoyed. So um, I know we're all grateful for John and, and for his efforts um, in preservation um, all over Sumner County. All right, so now I'm not gonna tell you about all the exhibits we have at the museum because we have about 10,000 square foot of exhibit space on three stories. So the first one I want to talk a little bit about is just um, some of the Native American um, artifacts and exhibits that we have now in Tennessee. Uh, in this area, there are records of the Paleolithic, Archaic, Woodland, and Mississippian um, Indian cultures. Now, um, as you can see, it's been determined that Indians inhabited this area for about 11,000 years. Um, both the Paleolithic and Archaic were wanderers and gatherers. Big game was followed wherever it went. Um, now we do have some pieces of copper in the museum. Um, that is the only metal that you can accredit to this, uh, these groups. Um, there's also some prehistoric cloth we have at the museum, which is uh, buffalo hide. And um, another really interesting artifact that we have is an, an atlatl. Now the atlatl was a device used for hunting that gave the Indians an advantage over just generally throwing a spear. An atlatl was usually a stick about this long with a hook on the end. Now the one that we have is a piece that's made out of a bone. So what they would do is take this stick with the hook, put a spear on it, and it would allow them to throw that spear um, a greater distance and with greater velocity, which would give them an advantage when hunting. Um, Next, the Woodland Indians um, stretched from the plains to the Atlantic. They slowly evolved and settled a village life with some agriculture. Weapons were improving along with tools and skills. Primitive pottery in its original stages as these pieces of pottery display. Soot from fire pits can still be seen on the pottery frequently found at the bottom of fire pits. And last and most recent would be the Mississippian um, Indians. Now, some of those tribes would include the Creek, Cherokee, Choctaw that were around this area. For whatever reason, I believe it's unknown, but Indians eventually moved out of this area of Tennessee, and they're all living in surrounding areas. Um, they used Tennessee as a, a common hunting ground, and they would even have agreements on who could hunt when based on the changing of seasons, and even sometimes uh, the blooming of certain trees would determine when one group could enter and another left. Now, when they were in surrounding areas, they would um, fight and carry on with one another, but while they were in Tennessee, they did have that agreement. Next, we've got a few pictures of some of these artifacts here. Uh, the hook for an atlatl uh, is at the museum. Uh, it's one of my favorite um, artifacts that we do um, have preserved. On the other end, you can see on the right side of the diagram, you can actually see the hook that would attach to the piece of bone and the spear. Now, one thing that I really found interesting was how they constructed their homes. You know, when I was a kid growing up, when we thought about Indians, teepees were the first thing to come to mind. Now, that was not the case in this area. Um, they lived in homes made from plants 
that were woven together and sort of cemented with daub, which if you all know anything about Tennessee soil, you dig down just a little bit and you hit clay. So they would take that clay and form a cement to construct their homes. <coughs> also, you can see some different pieces of pottery that were um, collected and preserved at our museum. Um, these were pulled out of a cave actually by uh, Mr. Garrett and they were all pieced back together. <coughs> and some other artifacts. Now I didn't show you a fraction of what we actually have on display. We'd be here all night. Um, but you can see the detail in some of these uh, pipes and effigies. Um, I really like the turtle effigy pipe. And you can even see behind that the bird effigy flute. I just think these are some remarkable artifacts that we're lucky to still have um, and displayed at the museum. <clears throat> Next, as we go along, we come to um, the Long Hunter period. And Long Hunters did a lot for Tennessee while they were exploring this area and helping to actually sort of set the lines for Tennessee and, and were able to give a lot of knowledge. Now, when I, when I was younger, I thought a Long Hunter was a Long Hunter because of his rifle that he carried. But that's not the case. We know that that would be due to the um, long hunting excursions that they went on. And if any of you have not had the chance to go out to Bledsoe Creek State Park, um, recently there was a fur trading cabin uh, replica that was constructed along with some lean-tos um, at Bledsoe Creek. Um, I've enjoyed um, the opening for those, and I think it's great that we have that here, especially for younger children that are learning about our history. One thing that's, that's hard for me to imagine, and I, I try to tell this to the kids that come and tour the museums, is, you know, to imagine Tennessee or Gallatin even with no roads, no buildings, no streets, nowhere to take refuge, and, and, and try to plant that, that image into the, the kid's head to help them understand how tough these guys actually were because they were gone for up to six months and normally their hunts went from fall to spring and so they were out during the times that the weather was the harshest and with, with you know little or no shelter so the items that you saw on the screen here are all items um, that a long hunter would have carried on their person while out on these expeditions. I often tell the ladies that come through a tour, y'all have more in your purse than a long hunter would have had <laughs> on his person to survive for six months at a time. And we know that the most important item the long hunter had was his rifle, his powder horn, and his knife for skinning. Um, long hunters had to be competent in many different areas such as trapping, hunting, fishing, skinning, marksmanship, self-defense, trading, canoeing, horsemanship, tracking, exploring, mental and physical toughness, wilderness survival, skills, folk medicine, frontier doctoring, diplomacy, English, French, Spanish, and Native American languages. <laughs> Just the languages alone. Um, get me. But anyways, um, one of the stories that I really like to tell, and one that I think has sort of been forgotten, um, is the tor story of Thomas Sharp Spencer, also known as Thomas Bigfoot Spencer. Now all the kids' eyes get really wide when I ask them about if they knew anything about Bigfoot being in Tennessee. And it's one story that they thoroughly enjoy. And if you don't know anything about Thomas Spencer, Thomas Spencer is probably one of the most famous long hunters to step foot in Middle Tennessee. Um, he was actually considered um, to be the first person of European scent to plant a crop in uh, Middle Tennessee. He actually spent the entire winter inside of a sycamore tree that was located uh, at Bledsoe's Lick on uh, what now is Winwood's property. I know there's a marker there, and there are lots of stories 
um, related to Thomas Spencer. Um, and one of my favorite stories would be the story of Thomas at an encampment, and there were some militia men there, and the story goes that Thomas was a little under the weather, he wasn't feeling well, and he, he was awakened by some men having a, a quarrel, and once he determined which man was at fault, he simply walked up, picked him up by his britches, and tossed him over what was said to be an eight-foot fence of the encampment. And the gentleman he, he tossed over was a little bit embarrassed, but got up, brushed himself off, and asked, well, Mr. Spencer, if you'd be so kind as to throw my horse over, I'll be on my way. <laughs> now, whether or not all these stories are true or not, I'm not sure, but I would like to think that they are. Uh, his, his nickname actually came from the size of his footprint that he left in the mud. Uh, the story is that the Native Americans and the Indians didn't want to have anything to do with him and would not track him. They thought that there could possibly be a giant living among them and they didn't want anything to do with him. Um, but he eventually was killed uh, by a bullet um, from an ambush. And while I was doing a little research, this actually came from uh, the Tennessee Encyclopedia and it was um, by Walter Durham. Uh, Now, to tie off of Thomas Spencer, I want to tell you a little bit about some programming uh, currently in the works for the museum. Um, now, the Traveling Trunk Program is not a new program. It was an, uh, a program uh, that told, told the story of a child's life, about children live um, in the late 17, early 1800s. Um, but we're looking to revitalize this program um, we've gotten about all the curriculum in place, um, but what we plan to do to tie in with the fourth grade curriculum and start there um, is to actually tell the story of the Native Americans in this area and of the long hunters through the eyes of Thomas Spencer. So someone dressed in period attire um, as a long hunter will go to a, the schools and um, implement this programming. So, with the sort of um, decline in field trips recently, we thought that it would be important to take the museum to the students as a way to raise awareness and a way to make history um, interesting and, you know, to connect with those students. I think a big thing today is that connection piece, you know, taking those stories about our history and, and connecting uh, with children and adults. You know, the museum you can go through and see a lot of artifacts, but what we're looking to do in the future is to provide a storyline to connect those pieces together. <laughs> now, my favorite part of my job is field trips. Um, you know, seeing these kids and actually uh, having them ask lots of questions um, is really um, important to me and, and, and seeing their interests um, gives me a great deal of joy. But we do, we do a lot of field trips and one thing that I'm excited to announce for the first time tonight is that the Sumner County Museum along with Trousdale Place are partnering together um, for field trips. So groups of students will be able to come tour not only the museum uh, but Trousdale Place as well. We're really excited about this. We have 150 students coming uh, in May from Jack Anderson Elementary, a group of third graders. Now we are doing some other things um, as well. We have a preschool program uh, where children come over to the museum. They go through the exhibits one at a time, so one maybe per week or two, um, and then they have a story related to that um, along with a, you know, a small craft. And another thing we're looking to do is not only bring the kids to the museum, but for those that can't, sort of like the trunk program, but on a smaller level, take things from the museum to those preschools to help make those connections. Now, I hope this video plays. Another thing that we have just recently started as Stories of Sumner, 
So it's a series of interviews that capture the past of Sundry County from different viewpoints. You don't have to be a Kenneth Thompson or Walter Durham or someone like that to participate in this set of interviews. We're looking to get stories from everyday people and everyday walks of life and how they remember um, these stories. So if you go to the next slide, we should have a short promo video for these. And if you'll go back one. Okay, if you'll take the arrow over, it should bring up a play bar underneath that black box. Hello. Welcome to our interview today. Mr. Homer Bradley is with us today, a resident of Cairo, and I assume, Mr. Homer, a resident all of your life in Cairo, Tennessee. Am I correct? Absolutely. Yes, sir. All 89 years. Have you spent a lot of days fishing on the Covenant River when you were a kid? I did. Uh, I was, never could swim. Two things I never could accomplish were swimming and dancing. <laughs> I stayed on the water all all times fishing. Okay. Out in the middle of that Cumberland River, an old wooden boat wasn't worth two dollars. I guess that God was taking care of me. And when did electricity come to Cairo? I don't remember the year, but I could tell you I can take you right now to where my dad and I was going to Galton from Cairo. Uh -huh. And we passed the gentleman and he stopped us. And told my dad, says, give me a five dollar deposit, we're gonna put K we're gonna put electricity out in Cairo. And so dad did, said, now if we don't do it, you get your five dollars back. But we left all the way to town about the very idea of putting electricity in Cairo. But that was the starting of it. But if we went a long time, didn't have no electricity. I know. I know. We had an ice box. Okay. And uh, the gentleman come around once a week put a 50 pound block of ice up in the ice box. Of course, you took a pick, pick you off the ice and used it like that. But we was really uptown with the ice box. Sure, yeah. I wonder what a block of ice cost for 50 pounds of ice in those days. Don't we have no idea, probably a quarter, I yeah. guess. And I do have some, uh, some records of what Cairo started out with and the year and everything. Tell me about those records then. Well then, 1799, James Winchester, he bought 150 acres, and he founded Cairo. And the county court met there for three years, and it was incorporated in 1815, and it became a very famous uh, landmark. It had four doctors, two schools, 13 stores, a cotton mill, a wooden mill, a grist mill, a saw mill, a steel house, a silversmith, smith, a boat yard, a shoemaker, a church, and Bell Tabin. And I understand that Bell Tabin was a pretty active place when all the boat people come in and sure. been on the water for ages and come to the Bell Tavern. With a hearty thirst, I'm sure. I'm sure there was. Yeah. So at that point, probably because of the location of the river, and that was a major form of transportation and commerce and, uh, and transport of uh, any kind of livestock and or commodities at that point, it would have been larger than uh, at that time in its history than the Gallatin population or any of the other nearby communities, would it not? We'll give you an idea. I think Galton had 42 and a half acres in their city. Okay. Cairo had 150 acres. Quite a three times as much yep. or more. Yep. Of course, when the truck and the, and the railroads, that put the, the river traffic out of business. Yes. That's when Cairo went down. Yeah. What would you like folks most to remember about Cairo? You're, you're, you're the unofficial mayor of Cairo. Well, I'd like them to remember Cairo as a, it still is. Uh, uh, back in those days, it was a gathering place. Yeah. It had two stores back in my time, and everybody didn't have no television to watch, so everybody went to the store and sat on the front porch. Or in the winter, back around the potbelly yep, stove. Yep, yep. 
got them a cold drink box and sat on it, got them a cold drink and a bag of peanuts. That cost a dime. But you could buy you a cold drink and a moon pie. That cost a dime. And buddy, whenever I found me a dime, I jumped on my bicycle and took off to Cairo <laughs> and spent that dime. Sure. Uh -huh. What do you know about the military maneuvers in, uh, in uh, Cairo during the war, or well, prior to or after? Cairo was the prime stop for the military, for the maneuvers. I believe the Blue Army was on the other side, the Lebanon side. The Red Army was on our side. And it was right there in the heart of Cairo was where so much of the maneuvers was. I remember sitting on the front porch and watching the different vehicles go by. I remember the office, one right of us, leave by of it, rain and cold and snow, and they was all out there in the front yard. Just uh, watching, I guess, God. And in the summertime, it would be so hot. I remember we had a well out the front yard. And the yard was full of these soldiers, and they was down on the knees crawling. And they'd pitch me the canteen, and I'd fill it up, pitch it back to them. Really? Because <laughs> they didn't have no water. Sure. And uh, also, uh, we had this river bottom I was telling you about. Yes. My daddy rode his horse down there one day, and he found one of the soldiers. They somehow or another lost him. And he didn't have that with the meat in three or four days. And daddy got some food, took to him. And they never did come back for that fellow for about two weeks. Really? And so we fed him the whole time he was down there. Yeah. And we, all the actors all over, we got the nicest letter from him to tell us how he appreciated taking care of him. Yeah. Skip, it's been a pleasure. You know, you've been one of my favorite people on the radio for many, many years. So that's the short version. Um, but we are uploading these to our website um, as quickly as we can. Um, and we look to just keep on going. So if you're interested or know anyone that would be perfect for one of these um, interviews, be sure to contact me. Um, oh, when I was growing up, Cairo to me was a place to, I could put a boat in the water, but um, I you know, learned over the years that it was actually a really important um, trade port here and almost became the uh, county seat. But, um, you know, stories like this that, that we're interested in. Now, moving along a little bit to the first item donated to the museum. Um, so the old courthouse that was tore down in 1939. Then uh, we've got some photographs up here on the table if anyone's interested to look at those later. Uh, but in, in the museum sits the pinnacle and the bell in the tower, which was there for over 100 years. But you can see the pinnacle here, the bell. Now there's some bullet entrance and exit holes on that pinnacle and from what I'm told is during the Civil War Union troops were occupying Gallatin and they would at times shoot at it for target practice but go to the next. and that bell would ring well oh, sorry. that bell you're good that bell would ring on a Thursday once a month to let everybody know that it was Mule Day and that mules were being sold on the square. <laughs> and next, one thing that is not on display yet, but we have some of the artifacts to, is the first airmail. Now, who all knew about the first, who knows about the first airmail? I didn't either. <laughs> I have a few. Well, the first recorded airmail, recorded, I'm sorry, peacetime, airmail. There was a, a record of an airmail prior um, during the war via pigeons. But the first recorded peacetime airmail was in a hot air balloon known as the Buffalo from Nashville to Gallatin. And I think this is a pretty big deal. 
And I'm going to read to you an article in the Sumner County News, just a short bit of it. It says, Airmail between Nashville and Gallatin was the world's first peacetime delivery, according to historians. Several years ago, Eric Hildensheim, a former Danish Army and commercial air pilot at the time, had started collecting data. An aviator in the United States came to Nashville and Gallatin to collect information on the world's first airmails for a history he was preparing. <coughs> Actually, the first airmail was what I mentioned earlier with the carrier pigeons, but the second was out of Nashville on June 17, 1877. Now, this was the stamp that would have been on, um, there, were, there were three pieces of mail that were thrown from the balloon as it traveled um, into Gallatin. One of those pieces was on display and we have some copies of it up here, and also there will be some in just a moment on the PowerPoint. But one of these was on display at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. So, doing the research, I called them. Wanted to find out if it was still there, what the information could they send me on. Well, unfortunately, the gentleman that had loaned it to the museum had, had taken it back off of loan and then recently passed away and they did not have any idea of where this was at. But in one of Walter Durham's books, I'm just going to read off the board, <coughs> A Pictorial History of Sumner County, Walter Durham and James Thomas. The first air travel in Sumner was by hot air balloon, although the earliest date is unknown. <clears throat> the most notable balloon flight occurred June 18, 1877, promoted by J.B. Lillard, a Nashville newspaper reporter who wrote, the southwesterly winds from that city to Gallatin where he, deliver, where he air delivered mail. The name of the balloon was Buffalo and the balloonist was Samuel A. King. The United States Postal Service issued a commemorative stamp marking the anniversary of the flight in 1977. Now, this is one of the envelopes that was dropped and so this is one of the only three covers record, recorded bearing the Buffalo Balloon stamp. It is addressed to Miss Lenora Davies in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> now, this letter would have been in another envelope. So here's a copy of that envelope. Y'all are more than welcome to come and look at this afterwards. But this would have been in another envelope, a message from the Buffalo Balloon. And there were instructions on what to do if you found this. Now, they also placed instructions on the individual envelopes in case this one was destroyed and the mail was dispersed. Which was a good thing that they did that. But, because after it made its first trip to Gallatin, the next day it traveled east and from another account, the balloon crashed and was destroyed. Now, another artifact that we do have is a letter. Now, this letter is to the Elder's Bookstore owner in Nashville from Carrie Barth Whiteside. Now, I'm going to read this letter as well. It says, Dear Sir, I found at last the envelope that was thrown from the Buffalo Balloon. She had it. She had stored it at home. I guess she had misplaced it. Um, she said the message is or was filed in the WUT office. At that time, my uncle Martin Barth was agent, freight telegraph operator, and ticket agent. I was his only assistant just about 14 years of age. 
His name was mine until I married in 1882. I think it was 1877 that it landed out on the home or land of Colonel Turner. I recall that W.G. Ventries was supervising the loading of wheat. My uncle and myself were eating our lunch on the platform southwest of station. We heard their horn distinctly, and as soon as the message came, it was telegraphed to paper. And when the balloon ascended, we wired to that effect and had watched it on its way until it landed here. I'm glad to send it to you, and I suppose it would be of interest to the airmail historian. It was our first mail by air received in Gallatin. Mr. Douglas Culberson wrote an article some years later relative to it. The balloon was brought into town the next day and ascended, but was caught in trees near Lafayette and destroyed. Colonel Turner's home was out of town one and one half miles, I take it. I lived on North Water Street and recall very vividly the balloons passing into town with Colonel's daughter, Miss Addie, and me, and one or two other girls. I alone am left to tell this tale, which is as I saw it. Very respectfully, Carrie Barth Whiteside. Now, come to find out, this, these artifacts were actually on display a time before, which I was not aware of. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see exhibit material compliments of Sumner County Library, Gallatin, Tennessee. So, I did a little tracing or tracking, and apparently these artifacts had gone from Miss Whiteside to the Elder's Bookstore in Nashville, was purchased by Johnny Maddox, which I'm sure most of you are aware of Johnny Maddox, and um, was sold from Johnny Maddox to the library, and then came to be sold to the museum years later. So it's almost came full circle. He sold the director to the museum. He did, Johnny did. I told you Kenneth would correct me if, it, if any of the information was wrong. Uh, but to me, I mean, this is, this is an awesome story that um, we need to, to at least create, you know, an um, exhibit for at the museum and, and to be able to tell, um, being part of the first recorded um, airmail in history. Now, the last thing, and we'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, recently, uh, some property was donated to the museum. Uh, we talked a little bit about Mr. John Garrett in the beginning, and um, he has graciously donated his home, uh, Stonewall, to the museum. And thanks to Kenneth's efforts, we have just about got it back to the way it would have been in the 1830s. Um, it was built by Dr. Levi Ring in 1831, and just recently donated to us. So I'm going to take you through just a few pictures of the interior, um, as decorated by Mr. Thompson. This will be the room to the left as you come into the house. The parlor. In the parlor. The dining room. I control the scene from that angle. Entrance hall on the left. Oops, this is upstairs okay. in the bedroom on the right. Thank you. All right. That's upstairs in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. With a little bed. <laughs> <laughs> so, stay tuned. We will be planning on doing some, some different types of events there and uh, utilizing this property. It's a wonderful home. Uh, we're lucky to have it and lucky and thankful for the opportunity to preserve it. This is another bedroom um, in the front of the house, the front left, and if you'll notice, the rug on the floor uh, was actually made by John, imagine that, um, on a loom he had in his workshop, and he told me that he could make about three foot an evening. It's about how long it took um, to make that floor. Credits for the photography. And the big question everybody wants to know. 
I get, to, I get asked two questions. Most common two questions I get asked. One, how did we get the fire engine downstairs? And two, when are we moving to the carriage house? So, uh, another thing that John did before he passed was raise the money to purchase the carriage house for the museum uh, in hopes that we could move the museum to the carriage house. Now, one thing about this move, we do lose about 3,500 square foot. So, earlier I was talking to you a little bit about storylines and the museum and how we want to create this storyline of Sumner County. And, yeah, there's a lot of stories that can be told. So right now we're, we're kind of working with what that actually looks like, how we want, what stories we want to tell, and how we want to tell them. Uh, so think of um, a modern day museum facility that will utilize um, different types of multimedia, um, interactive components that we can use to effectively tell these stories and using our best artifacts to support that storyline. Um, if you come to the museum, you can see a case of 200 arrowheads, but you know what we want to do is tell the story, how they were used, what they are, and use our best ones to support that, just as an example. Another example might be um, sort of recreating the interior of, of Randy's record shop and having listening stations where you could listen to different uh, Sumner County <coughs> artists. But not to give too much away, um, it's probably going to be more of a five-year plan in order to do this. Uh, a lot of funds are going to be have to raise, be raised in order to renovate the home and then to um, install a museum facility. There are some plan, preliminary site plans for the museum. And just to give you an idea, and we can go through these pretty quickly, um, just some examples of, of how we're thinking we would like this to look. And you can just roll through these one every two or three seconds. So, see a lot of you know text images um, another way could be with some uh, different types of applications through um, iPads or other types of technology uh, to tell the story now this is uh, a museum in um, Birmingham and one thing that they did was create a hologram of satchel page throwing a pitch and I was able to go down um, and look at this and the reason I'll show you this is the company that we're looking to help us um, with the technology side um, actually did this museum this is the Negro Southern League Museum in Birmingham and you can go in and watch Satchel Page throw a baseball and follow the baseball across the room it's really neat um, but just some just kind of give you some general ideas of, of what we're thinking but Again, some other ways to display artifacts um, with interactive devices. All right, and last but not least, we're always looking for volunteers at the museum. Um, some different ways that you can volunteer. We do need help uh, at the front desk. If anyone's interested in giving tours, um, we do have a lot of tour groups come through, and we do provide training for that as well. Um, I have gardeners on there because John had a pretty um, big area of flowers and gardens at his house that we're maintaining. Um, uh, also program development, we've talked about the trunk and uh, the uh, preschool programs that we have. Uh, and then also uh, with Candlelight Cemetery, Cemetery Tour. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kenneth Thompson and let him tell you a little bit about the cemetery tour.
Somebody left some food in here. <laughs> well, I'm here to put you to sleep. Last year, when I lectured, I looked up and one woman was... <laughs> so I'm aiming for two to go to sleep. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk... As you all know, I know more dead people than anybody in Sunday County. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, dead people. Matt, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's dead. <laughs> I know Patrick can hear me. He is passing out copies of the map of the cemetery. <clears throat> Does anybody know what the word cemetery means? It's a Greek word for what? Sleeping place. And I don't mean you all go to sleep. Either. Anyway, in 1814, Felix Grundy from Nashville, and I don't know whether anybody knows who he is or not, but he was a very prominent citizen of Nashville. He built a house where James K. Polk died and he lived in it himself too many years and sold it to Pope when he left the presidency. <clears throat> and he has a descendant that lives here in Gallup, Felicia Cox. But he was an entrepreneur and he came to Gallatin and bought 375 acres in the southwest quadrant of the city. And it's called the Grundy Edition. It was the first subdivision in the town. And the farthest point is the cemetery in that quadrant because he sold off part of the land across Nashville Highway where the Epic Center is. He sold 137 and a half acres to Walter Bill Morris who built a house called Evergreen, which I'll mention in a little while. <clears throat> in 1814, he gave one acre of ground for the cemetery. And if you look at that map, it's old A at the bottom of the page. That's the oldest section of the cemetery and that's where the <clears throat> Mexican monument is so far. <clears throat> the first known burial in the cemetery, and not necessarily the first person buried there, but the first one that's marked as a surviving marker is Neil McCauley. And he came here from Ireland to visit his brother Daniel and he died. He was buried there in November 1818. <clears throat> there is a history that's been written in the cemetery, but it has some inaccuracies in it. And one of them is, in 1826, Grundy sold to the trustees of the Gallatin Church a lot for $100. And this history says it was Methodist. It was not a Methodist because the trustees were Presbyterian mostly. <clears throat> and it was at the corner of Bledsoe and Cemetery Street, and there's a little house there today where that little log church was built in 1826. <clears throat> it was for all denominations, and before anybody built their own church, they all used that building. And it sat there until 1870, 71, and the city wanted to take it and use it as a schoolhouse at that point. Um, in 1831, a transition started taking place in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In the old days, they called these, they didn't call them cemeteries, they called them graveyards. And nobody wanted to go to a graveyard. It was the most boring place you could go to. <coughs> and all you could do was walk through and cry or something. But they wanted to make parks out of them, landscaped parks. And the first one in the United States was St. Alban in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it was founded by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And it was for pleasure and relaxation, reflecting history and culture with art artistic and architectural significance. And I'd say in the 18th century, they used slate for markers. 19th century, they went to marble. And right after the Civil War, they had the capability with equipment to cut um, granite. And there were, if you go through the cemetery, you'll see different meanings carved into the stone. Arches mean victory and death. Cross swords, high-ranking military. 
cross, emblem of faith, handshake, farewell. And thistles, remembrances, trees, life, and so forth is a long list. That's just an example. <coughs> From uh, the oldest section, A, old section A, and I told you about the Mexican monument. That monument, of course, was put up in 1848, right after 1848 been restored several times and I know in the late 1930s it was the foundation collapsed and they had to put it back together. <coughs> when I was president of the Historical Society years ago, well 15 years ago or so, we spent $20,000 on that monument, put all new tablets on all four sides and recarved all the names on it so you could read them. In section A, old section A, the largest lot is the voyage lot. They've used that for six generations and they're still using that lot. Pre-1870s, the Negroes were buried with the, their family, the white family. They were buried on, on the lot. Timelines are usually based, if anybody's taken history courses, timelines are based on wars. They usually go, you know, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, at least that's what I'm doing here. <coughs> there are four persons uh, with markers in the cemetery to revolutionary soldiers. Three of them were transfers, one of them is a cenotaph. Anybody know what a cenotaph is? It's a monument to someone, but they're not buried there. They're not buried there, right. <coughs> James Trousdale. <laughs> whose land Gallatin is located on, was buried out on Northwater Street on, behind his house. And that house burned many years ago. In the 1940s, they moved the graves to his son's lot, Governor Trout. <coughs> James Oldham was buried out on near the part of the McLean Farm. You know where the McLean Farm is, the old McLean Farm that faced the creek that was an old Georgian brick house back in there where the Odoms lived and James Odom was buried there and they moved him to the Gallatin Cemetery. Down on the National Pike there was where the twin houses are at Cajun Bend Road, National Pike, there was a big house there in the cemetery. They moved that cemetery in uh, 1914 moved William Gillespie, who was a revolutionary soldier. And then somebody put up a marker and it looks really new but it's been there a few years in the old part of We'll live in that Mexican monument to Zacchaeus Wilson. And I know he's not buried in that cemetery, and I know they didn't move him from anywhere. Mm -hmm. They just put up that marker, and it could have been the DAR, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <coughs> War of 1812, I'm not going to belabor this, but there are a good many people buried there that were in the War of 1812. One of them was Governor Trousdale. And of course, he was a war horse of Sumner County. He was in the War of 1812, he was in the Seminole War in 1836, he was in the Mexican War in 1848. And he got upset because he was too old to go to the Civil War. <laughs> Colonel Greenberry Williams is buried there. Uh, we don't know where. Now, several years ago, I put up four markers. Bailey Payton Sr., Jr., Greenberry Williams Sr., and Jr. on one of my lots. They're cenotaphs. <laughs> Military markers. Because the older ones were in the War of 1812. And the younger ones the Civil War. But anyway, the sad thing is, if there's not a marker on the lot down there, we don't know whose lot it is. And Colonel Greenberry Williams' lot does not have any markers at all. So we don't know where that lot is. And I'm sure it's in the oldest section of the cemetery, but we just don't know where it is. <coughs> the records of the cemetery, most of them burned in the early 1950s, so we don't know anything except there's a record book kept by Willie Blue from 1850s to 1880s that tells who's buried there, what they died of, and what the burial date was. It's a burial book, which is very informative. But it doesn't tell us today where those lots are unless there's a marker there. Uh, it's interesting to see what they died from. That's, that's, that's very interesting to me. The Seminole War in Florida in 1836, of course, Governor Trousdale went, General Trousdale, Josephus Conn Gill, 
and he had started his house Rosemont that year and so he left his wife in charge of building that house and she had a little office out in front of the yard there where she supervised the building of that house. <coughs> Dr. James Franklin III was another guy that went to the Seminole War. He lived at a brick house across from Blue Ridge Country Club, which is no longer there. Of course, the Civil War, there was, well, many people in the cemetery that fought the Civil War, both sides. <coughs> One interesting guy I'm going to tell you about. You go in the main entrance on the left, there's a pretty good sized monument, John Iss. And John Iss came from France during the Civil War to New York. And the first thing they did was they conscripted him off of the street and put him in the Union Army. And it was, he just went, you know, he didn't know what else to do. <coughs> Ended up with the Army in Gallatin during the war. And he liked it so well that he came back and married here. A lot of those Union soldiers came back here and married. Well, the Confederate soldiers were organized after the war and they had what they call the Donaldson Bivouac. Well, all of his friends were <coughs> in the Donaldson Bivouac, but he, he couldn't get in there because he was a Union soldier, a federal soldier. So, so they adopted him so he could come to the meetings. <laughs> <clears throat> there were many small additions to the cemetery through the years, and I have the list, but I'm not going through that. The biggest addition was the far southern addition, where the big trial the monument is, next to the railroad over there. That was seven and a half acres, and that came off of Spencer's Choice Plantation, and General Joseph Miller son sold them the seven and a half acres. Joseph Miller came here from Kentucky in the 1830s and he got an award from the state of Tennessee for having a farm in high state of cultivation. And he got a silver service and a big bronze medal and all this stuff. But anyway, that came off, that seven and a half acres came off that place. So the, the largest lot in that section, that seven and a half acres, is the Miller lot, of course. And, and it is a large lot, <clears throat> and I have a lot of fun with that lot. There's a, a big sarcophagus there, right next to it, it said Blackmore. And uh, we had a tour last year. When was that tour of the school kids? In the fall. In the fall. And we had several groups that came all morning. Well, I had one actor, Martha Smith. Anybody know Martha Smith? I said, Martha, you want to play a ghost? So she hid behind that marker. And so when we got there, these kids like this, you know, I said, would y'all like to meet a ghost? Oh. Yeah! And when she came out with some, two of them ran. <laughs> <laughs> and then they came back, can we touch it? You know, yeah, you touch it. Can we have a picture made with it? Yeah. <laughs> so the next group of groups we're going to have, I'm going to have two actors. I'm going to have Bill Baker. <laughs> He's good. <laughs> um, I've told you, most of you, half of you know this by now, but every time I teach a class at Vol State or uh, lecture and put people to sleep, I'll say, who is buried in the Galton Cemetery that was first lady of a foreign country and never went there? Anybody know? Eliza Allen, Sam Houston's first wife. They were married a few, she was first lady of Tennessee, of course, for a few weeks. And then he took off and went west. And they didn't divorce for eight years. And he sought the divorce in eight years. But he was already the president of the Republic of Texas when he got that divorce. And hers is the most visited grave in the cemetery by out of town people. Um, in 1880, now I told you about the transitional efforts in Mount Auburn and uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. 1880, Gallatin City Council hired a landscape architect and to lay off at Remodel Cemetery. Well, when I was growing up, 100 years ago, Malcolm, yeah. <laughs> The cemetery had iron benches, it had many iron fences 
around the graves. It had boxwood, it had flowers that came up every year. It was like a park. And just gradually things started disappearing. The benches started disappearing, the urns, there were big cast iron urns. All the fences started disappearing and they put them behind the building back there and the city would just sell them to whoever came along. <clears throat> I'll tell you something else that did. Still irritates me and I didn't know it for the last few years what happened to all that money. They're more careful with it now, but when I was growing up, I knew all these people that died in my family and some in other families. And a lot of them I lived out of town, but they'd ship the body back here, but then the family would give several thousand dollars or they would will several thousand dollars to maintain that lot. They threw it in the general fund. And of course, we've organized now and we're going to do something about that. I mean, repairing the stones and trying to get that cemetery back in shape because it's out of shape. 1872, they set aside a burial ground for the Negroes. In 1880, the colored odd fellows were buying lots. And of course, if you belong to a lodge and had a lot, you know you didn't have to buy one. They just helped bury you and put you on that lot. The churches did the same thing. The Presbyterian Church owns a lot at the Galvin Cemetery. One Ada Fraser, who thought knew everything, was secretary at the Presbyterian Church for years, and she didn't know we had a lot. <laughs> when Sarah Moffat died, we buried on that lot. He's going to be buried on that lot. <clears throat> the largest tombstone in that cemetery is the Trousdale Odom shaft in the back of the cemetery. And they had to build a spur railroad track to bring that thing in in 1900. And I don't know what it cost, but I suspect at that time probably $10,000. And of course, <clears throat> Katie Trousdale. Bill Langley Hall, and Judith Morgan wrote a book about it. A lot of interesting facts in there. Katie was one of the most interesting people that ever lived in this county. Her grandfather, Eli Odom, was where the money came from, not from the trousers. And he died an old man in 1869, and he did not lose a dime in the Civil War. He had investments all over the country, and he kept them, and he left her the richest little three-year-old in the county. And her father managed it well, and, and uh, she lived well all the life. She owned the bank. She owned First and People's Bank and married the president after they'd gone together for 25 years because she didn't want to have children. Everybody died of childbirth. Her mother and grandmother both died of childbirth. <coughs> but she was, they were very generous. And I know, let's see, in 1921, they used to take up money for the cemetery from all the families. I'm going to have a list here. Most people gave a dollar and two dollars or three dollars. She gave 50. And that's the way she operated. She had relatives, and this is not in the book, cousins that won hard times here in Gallatin. And at one time, uh, 90 years ago, she gave them all $50,000 a piece. So they'd have something to live on. That's the kind of person she was, you know. <clears throat> the second largest monument in the cemetery is Dr. Jesse Head Johnson. And he had one daughter, and they lived out of sight of you. And uh, Mary Lucy. And Mary Lucy never married, and she was tied as bark on a tree, and when she'd send a servant or whomever to the store out of sight of you to buy something if it was three and a half cents, she'd take a hatchet to the uh, penny and break it in half. <laughs> so she, she ended up with a lot of money. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to tell you just a tad about the cemetery tour. 1997, Donna Smith, the director of the museum, and with Barbara Parker, conceived the idea for a historic cemetery tour. This has been done in Europe for a long time. We've had characters portrayed in the first person representing a multiplicity of former residents from governors and ambassadors 
the murderers. And many of these people were portrayed by their descendants, a well, member of the family, which I think is interesting. <clears throat> I'm going over a few of these quickly, and, and uh, I'll tell you about the murderers as we go. <laughs> Miss Venus Stewart, she, she is an interesting character. She lived over there across from Garrett Brothers in the little house her father died in 1879. She was the oldest child died, and she graduated from Howard Female College in 1887, went to Webb School and taught for a year and then came back. And the building's still up here on East Main Street, in the Main Street School, <clears throat> the other side of the Baptist Church. That was the public high school. And uh, from 1888 to 1914. And they only had one principal, Captain Charles Sanders Douglas. And my grandfather went there. He, he said if he caught you talking at the wrong place, that he popped his head together. <laughs> that, that kind of cured a few people. <laughs> William Trousel talked about Governor William Trousel. He lived at the Trousel place down here, built by John Bowen. And I had somebody call me this morning from Texas and said they found John Bowen's son buried out there. The remote area where they lived. He was born in this house, tried to place, eight, early 1800s. Eliza Allen, whom I told you about, she grew up where the steam plant is, that was her father's plantation. <coughs> Late years, when after she divorced and married Dr. Elmore Douglas, he built her a house behind the Guthrie building on West Main. It's the first building on West Main going out of town. She had an English basement house, Michelle like yours. Joseph Bertrand, another story. Joseph Bertrand was a Frenchman. He and his twin brother were in love with the same girl. His brother Henry won her hand and he became a field marshal in the Napoleon. So Joseph Bertrand went with Leclerc to the Indies and then ended up in Richmond, Virginia, married and came to Gallup little bitty man. <clears throat> um, in the 1840s, his brother Marshall Bertrand and some of his cronies came to Nashville on a visit and were being entertained and Thomas Boyers was a newspaper reporter. He and a friend went to a party in Nashville for Bertrand and his friend and they knew of course his last name was Bertrand. They looked at him and they said he looks just like old man Bertrand and Gallatin. So they asked him, are you kin to him? He said, I have a brother named Joseph Bertrand, but I didn't know where he was. So he sent a courier to Gallatin to, to his brother, and when his brother found out who sent the courier, he slammed the door in his face. <laughs> but Bertrand uh, was uh, written up uh, during the Civil War. He was an old man, and they said after uh, Opie Reed wrote in one of his books that after a uh, a victory, one of the victories that old man Bertrand got the cowbell off of the cow and going up and down the street, tottering up and down the street ringing the cowbell. Robert M. and Thomas Boyes, you're sitting on the land of, of the house of Robert Morris Boyes. <coughs> His father Matthew came here from South Carolina, York District, South Carolina. Robert was a uh, very active man in the community in every way. He had a store, he, had, he was in the real estate, founded the Presbyterian Church. And um, his son Thomas was the one I told him was a reporter. He ended up owning a business that closed last year that had been here 160 years. Examiner. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, Katie, I told you about Katie. Josephus Con Gill, of course, was a builder of Rosemont, a lawyer who defended, he was known for defending the Indians and the blacks. He was really good at both those things. Henry Fitzgerald, who came here during the Civil War and bought property out here where his house still stands, where Monell's restaurant was, he bought that and had a mill out there. He paid like $26,000 for that property during the Civil War. And he made money on the black market. He had saltpeter mines and he sold 
saw Peter at both sides, north and south. He was an Irishman, he didn't care. <laughs> he was making money. Now, Dr. Henry Augusta Shell, we have done, and we have just published a book, Town in Turmoil, Historical Society, of a diary I have of Ms. Shell, his mother, Mary Robertson Shell. And her husband was a civil smith and jeweler here. And Dr. Shell lived behind the old health department out here at House Face Winchester Street. His mother lived where the line bank is on East Main. And she kept this diary. The main part of it is from August to December 1862. And she tells about the Battle of Gallatin. And with her account of the battle and Opie Reed's account, that's information that nobody else has ever, well, what she wrote, nobody else has ever had. She told what all happened, who got shot, and who stole what. <coughs> then we have Mayor Felice Farrell. She was an antique dealer for 60 years. And she built that big log house across from the big Kroger store, six miles out. The main portion of that house sat right here, Robert Barrier's house. Miss Patty Malone. In 1890, she was superintendent of school. Only woman ever superintendent of school. Emily Turner Payton, Bailey Payton's daughter. They lived where all State is, had a big brick house. He was ambassador to Chile. She went with him. This was before the Civil War. And as his secretary, when she signed everything, E.T. Payton. So they paid her a salary. They didn't know it was a woman. <laughs> she was the first woman paid in foreign service by the United States government. Charles H. Reed, he came here from <coughs> Saratoga Springs, New York. He bought Fairview from Adelicia Franklin, Adelicia Hayes, Franklin, Acklin, Cheney. <coughs> and the true story of that's never been published. But her son was a drunk and a reprobate like her husband Acton was, and he lost so much money in Saratoga that she sold him fairly. So she didn't live there in years. This was in 1883, and she left there in 1846. So, and it had been sold out of the family, and she bought it back. And then she let it go to Mr. Reed. Then we had Jesse Moore, and we had a fire on the square in 1897 on this side. And one of the Tompkins' sons burned up in the fire, but Jesse Moore went in and saved the body from being completely burnt up. And they gave him, the Tompkins owned a lot of property, and they had a building on the east side of the square, the oldest building on the square, it was torn down several years ago by Thomas Goodall, built a new law office. And they gave him the second floor of that building, and he lived there the rest of his life, and he died in the 1930s. But he, had been a Texas Ranger and came back and he was so rough that he couldn't live with his family. So that's the reason he was able to live elsewhere. But he was a seller at outcry. You know what that is? An auctioneer. <laughs> you know how I know that? <laughs> they have a book where you have to get, where you have to buy a license to do that. And he's in the license book. Martin Barth. He mentioned Martin Barth. Carrie's uncle, but a carrier that had the letter. Martin Barth came here from Pittsburgh. He was a telegrapher. He taught Andrew Carnegie the Morse code. When Andrew Carnegie was a young boy, teenager. He came to Bowling Green, he was a telegrapher at Bowling Green. And when Sherman came, General William Tecumseh Sherman, he went with Sherman's army to march to the sea. And after the war, he came here as Galton's telegrapher. And he had the first telephone in Galton in the 1870s, about 78. At all these cemetery tours, we have greeters, and the greeters are not buried in the cemetery. We've had Dun Andrew Jackson and other people. So we had Albert Galton one year. Everybody thinks, that doesn't know any history, thinks Albert Gallatin lived here because he never saw this place. He was a Swiss and 
came to America, he was in Washington, New York, uh, primarily New York, one of the presidents that was up there. President Simpson Dressel. She lived in a house like yours on West Main Street. My second husband lived before her. She was a woman before her time. She was a suffragette. She was uh, campaigning for everything that she thought women ought to be involved in. And TB cures and stuff like just anything came along. But she primarily was a music teacher, a piano teacher, and a violin teacher. And of course, Johnny Maddox took from her. She was one of his teachers. Her father, we did in the cemetery too, Samuel Robert Simpson. He and he was a murderer, one of the murderers that we've done. And when he lived in, uh, well, he was an architect, and he came south building railroads. Ended up in Springfield. And his before and after the Civil War, his wife had this affair with a judge over there. So after the war, and Ms. Dresser was an illegitimate child of this judge. So in 1869, uh, he, he and his son cornered the judge in the alley and killed him. So they put him in jail, and they were in jail for a year, and Colonel James Jones Turner, who was the number one attorney in Gallatin, had been his commander during the Civil War. And he got a change of venue, brought him over here, got them all both off, so the Simpsons moved to Gallatin, and they ended up buying the carriage house residence. And they were well, architects, as I said, and they had a lumber business. They bought that property because the carriage factory was behind that brick building. That brick building was never a carriage factory. And when it was put on the National Register, they put on that it was a carriage factory, which is not true at all. So, and then another uh, murderess, Anna Dennis Dotson. <coughs> Anna Dennis Dotson lived in the house that's still standing between the square and the creek going north water. And Matt Thompson now owns it as a state farm insurance. He bought that building on the corner of that old house, the Chandler house. That's where Anna Dennis Dotson lived. Uh, <clears throat> Barb Deacon played her one year, and of course, if you know the story, she was in love with, she was married to Dr. Dodson, but she had, was in love with this dentist, Ty Cobb. <clears throat> he was, I mean, not a dentist, he was a barber. And he, to get away from her, he took a job on Broad Street in Nashville. So she, a few weeks later, went down there with a muff, fur muff and a gun, a pistol. Just walked in and shot him and killed him and sat down and waited for the police to come get her. <laughs> uh, but Chip Gaden, Judge Hamilton Gaden, wrote a book, Miscarriage of Justice. And I helped him with it. And afterwards, I was kind of sorry I did because it changed too many names and too many facts to suit me because I'm a purist when it comes to facts. <clears throat> but anyway, Barb Deacon played her, and the first group that went through, she pulled out that gun. <laughs> she had a blanket and scared everybody in the cemetery to death. <laughs> we thought somebody was after us. Okay, during the Civil War, we have three women who recorded history for us Alice Williamson. And Alice Williamson's father had the carriage factory at the carriage house up here. Colonel Robert Williamson. Williamson Adams Carriage Factory. But during the war, they had moved to the farm out here on the, just before you get to where 109 turns right on the left there. It's called the Bales Place later. But she recorded history, and then she was a teenager, about every day in 1864, and told about General Elias of Payne and how mean he was and, and how many people he shot that day and all that kind of thing. She, it's wonderful what she did in that. Dyer is now at Duke University. Uh, Laura Williams, Colonel Greenberry Williams, lived at Evergreen, daughter, wrote a letter two days after the fall of Fort Donaldson, which is a wonderful letter. I have that. 
and I have the shell diary. I have those two. Okay, Colonel James Alexander. Colonel James Alexander was a carpenter that built the carriage house. And when they built that, I shouldn't tell too much because I'm going to discuss this next week at the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. well, Dr. Ring had both of John's house built in the carriage house. And he had built the carriage house in 39. And Dr. Ring was head of Transmontania Academy, which is the house behind John's house with the column on it. It's still there. Built in 1812. <coughs> and uh, anyway, I better not tell you too much. You won't come to the dinner. I'll leave you hanging on that one. <laughs> tell you the rest this interesting story behind that. William H. Weems is buried in the cemetery. Anybody know who William H. Weems was? Mr. Will Weems. He and his first wife are buried there. Helen Peters. Of course, Miss Ellen was the one everybody knew. And she's buried at Mount Olivet with her family. But Mr. Weems' father came here from Greensboro, Alabama after the Civil War and bought Maple Shade out here, Scottsville Pike. He was number two man in the Sumner Deposit Bank. And but Mr. Weems was a founder of the world's largest power industry and was a very wealthy man. Peter Vertrees. Peter Vertrees is one of the more interesting characters to me, and I'll do a lecture on him. If you want to hear it, I've got two more hours. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Vertrees was born in 1840 in Edmondson County, Kentucky, to a mulatto father and a white mother, which is an unusual combination. He was reared by his mulatto father's white father, Jacob Vertrees, and after he was grown, well, of course, he went to the Civil War with his father's half-brother, who was a doctor, Dr. John Luther Bertrand. And after the war was over, his grandparents had died in Edmondson County, Kentucky. And he had two uncles living here. And one of them was Judge James Cunningham Bertrand, who lived where the Ramseys, the old Ramsey house on, across from the Triangle, the old house. That was the Bertrand's house. <clears throat> and they saw to it that his education was completed. And you had up there something about it, W. It's w. Overtrees, William Overtrees, something you had up there. William Overtrees was the son, and he helped Peter learn to read and write, finish reading and write, and get his secondary education. Then he went to Roger Williams University. And he was the foundation of educational of the system for the African Americans in Sony County. And he was a minister, of, second minister of the First Baptist Church for 54 years. His wife taught over 50 years. And uh, it's, it's a long story, but anyway, he, he was quite a character. His son, in, his son in law, Dr. Jonathan Nathaniel Rucker, took his place as pastor of the church, principal of Union High School, and was a doctor. He practiced medicine. If you got sick at school, or if anybody got sick, they went to the principal's office, even if they lived in the community. <coughs> he also bought the school buses uh, with help of the Jewish Rosenwald Foundation, and then he had to keep up the school buses with his own money, but he did that. Then we had Queen Victoria. <coughs> and that's an interesting set. Well, I had some company from England one time, and, and they were really interesting people, and they, <clears throat> I said, we have a Queen Victoria here. And so I took them to see Miss Vic, you know. And I said, Miss Vic, they're from England. Well, there was a Queen Victoria. Well, she was living when that Queen Victoria was living, too. So she was born in 1890, so she was nearly 100 then. And uh, she said, we got a black one over here. <laughs> I said, yeah, she's the queen of the kitchen. She was a culinary artist and, and uh, Caterer and a great person, and she worked for the Roth family at one time. And uh, she had these gold earrings like this with the finest from the you know, and had all these antiques in her house, and they came from the Roths, you know. She 
Dr. H.H. H. Bate, Humphrey Howell Bate, Jr. He was found at the Grand Ole Opry in the house where he was born. Of course, Hawthorne Hill, we have open to the public now. Edward Albright, who owned the Sumner County News, and when he became ambassador to Finland, he sold the paper to Rufus Body, whom I knew well. I didn't know Mr. Albright. He died before I was born. Uh, Samuel Nicholson, who came here from Massachusetts and had a woolen mill, Eagle Woolen Mill, over here on what we call, I call Depot Street, where the old locker plant was. Yeah. And he lived in a house up, if you know where Reggie Mudd lives, there was a house next door on the other side. And he didn't build the house, but he bought that house in 1867. And of course, he was from Massachusetts. His wife was from Lebanon. During the Civil War, he wanted to get the hell out of Tennessee, and he went to Massachusetts, and he made money during the Civil War working up there. He took his southern wife with him, and when Mr. Lincoln died, she wouldn't wear a black armband. <laughs> so they made it so hot for her, she had to come back south. <laughs> so he decided to bring her back south. <clears throat> he wanted to keep peace with her. The oldest photograph we have of Gallatin is because of him. And he had a picture made from the hill of North Water showing all the area down there at the creek and across the creek there was a big house that he owned half interest in, the corner of North Water Depot, and then the woolen mill. And it shows all that. It was made in about 1867-68. It's the oldest picture we have, an outdoor picture of Galton. It's at the archives. We did Major William Hadley. He was the first mayor of Gallatin in 1822. He ended up going to Nashville. His father's Revolutionary War hero, Joshua Hadley. Edward Sanders Payne. He was president of the First People's Bank at one time, lived up on East Main Street, where the apartments are across from the Triangle, Nathan on. Uh, and when I was growing up, his wife was living. Because he was a Confederate soldier. I grew up around five Confederate widows. Tell you how old we are, Janine. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie Payne, Mamie Patterson, who lived down the street and across the street. Ella Averett, Ella, she was, um, lived on Winchester Street at the foot of the hill. She was Ella Simmons, and she married Edward Jenkins Malone, and he died, and she married Mr. Avery, and he was in the Civil War. And Ms. Dyer over her trace, of course, her husband was in the Civil War. And Lowly Zell Blackmore, and James A. Blackmore's house was next to Presbyterian Church, and unfortunately, we tore that house down. But I knew those five widows. J.T. Baskell, he lived in the house behind the museum where John Glover lives. Uh, owned. He doesn't live there. He lives on the farm. Uh, but he was the attorney for Anna Dennis Dawson. She murdered Tycho. Abraham Randolph Franklin built the Guthrie Building on the square, built Langley Hall. Stafford H.R. Doyle it wasn't from here, but he married somebody from here, Miss Lucy. But he was commander of, of the first aircraft carrier, USS Langley. And they lived done cruising. World War I. The library is closing at 30 minutes. That means I gotta stop. <laughs> World War I, we did a book the year before last, Judas Morgan did it for us. Uh, on World War One, we have very few copies of that left. We have very few copies of the Civil War journal left that we just published. We've got a handful. I've got them all in the car. But Colonel Harry Berry was commander of the 115th Field Artillery and 30th Division, and most people from here were under him. And of course, Dr. Rucker was the only African American officer in World War One from Gallup. And Dr. William Lackey went from here, and Dr. Homer Reese, and and, and Dr. Reese married on the boat coming home. 
his wife, like the second wife, Helen O'Reilly. And we did her in the cemetery tour last year. And we, everybody we did last fall was a 401 connected. I forgot to tell you about Captain Simpson who did the murdering up here. He was an architect and he built the 1883 City Hall that's on Franklin Street behind the old Palace Theater. It's a restaurant. I don't know what's in my name. It was Franklin Station for a while and several different places. He built that in 1883. He built the old state penitentiary in Nashville. That big castle built up. And he built it 40, I think $40,000 under budget or something. They really liked him. <laughs> it's a magnificent building. I don't know how long it's going to last. But anyway, that's just, and we've recently, of course, organized the Cemetery Association to try to restore the cemetery. you have any questions? I didn't see anybody go to sleep, and I was hoping to be late too. <laughs> Um, are, are there any technologies to identify any unmarked remains or the location of unmarked they remains? That, they can do that, yeah. Are, are there any plans to possibly have that done? I think that will come about. We've, we've already had somebody <coughs> witch the grave down there. They can do that too. We've seen that done. <coughs> witch for water and you witch for the grave. <laughs> <laughs> 